I'm NASA Public Affairs Specialist Brandy Dean. On November 2, 2000, the very first expedition crew arrived at the International Space Station, and since then there have been an unbroken string of 241 astronauts from 19 countries on board supporting science experiments, performing spacewalks, and teaching us how to live long-term in space. But although the crew members in space might be the most visible piece of that puzzle, they are only a tiny percentage of the many, many people who have to work together to make sure missions are safe and successful. We're here today with some of the people that work on the ground, and in particular, through our Flat Operations Directorate. And we have a few International Space Station programs still always here with us as well. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and uh, tell a little bit about what they do. And then, in honor of the anniversary we're celebrating, I'd love for each of you to also tell us where you were 20 years ago when Expedition, 20, when Expedition 1 was just beginning. And we are going to start first with Norm Knight. Well, let's see, Brandy. Uh, it's really an exciting day, and uh, it's great to be on this panel. Uh, a little bit of my background. Um, I've worked in, in flight ops for many years. I, uh, I'm currently the deputy director of flight operations. You know, thinking back 20 years ago, which uh, some days it seems like yesterday, and some days it seems like a, a long, long time ago, uh, I had been uh, a group lead for one of the shuttle uh, groups, that, uh, that managed the main engines, solid rocket boosters, and external tank, and <clears throat> was recently selected as a flight director. So I was really transitioning from uh, shuttle to station. So exciting times, exciting memories, and uh, look forward to, to the rest of uh, the panel discussion today. Definitely. Thank you, Norm. Um, now we're going to go to Kenny Todd. Hey, good morning, Brandy, and uh, good morning to the rest of uh, – my esteemed colleagues on the panel, it's good to see all of you. Um, I am I'm the uh, deputy program manager for the International Space Station. Um, have been for a, a number of years here, but uh, work very closely with uh, with the entire flight operations community and and have done so for 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 close to the last uh, 20 years now. Um, when I think back to where we were, uh, where I was 20 years ago. Uh, obviously, I wasn't in this position, but at the time, my focus was over in avionics and software. And uh, one of the biggest challenges for a program such as this one, where you have hardware li you know, literally being built all over the United States and, and in other parts of the world um, by, by different countries, uh, one of the challenges was trying to figure out how to integrate all that hardware and software. And there was a big, big effort in that, that time frame uh, back, uh, back ending the last century uh, when we were really uh, starting to, to get this program off the ground and, and in orbit. And so at that time, uh, I, I had one camp uh, working, working real-time operations on the avionics and software side and um, uh, making sure everything was going okay on orbit as we, as we started to bring up these different systems. And uh, at the same time, uh, I was off uh, trying to figure out the next flights in the queue and how to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that we were all going to be good to go and trying to find problems on the ground so we didn't have to find them and, and give them to these, uh, to these flight directors <laughs> later on uh, when they have to, to deal with them. And again, good to see everybody. <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate that early work. Uh, <laughs> next up is Holly Ridings. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Holly Ridings. Uh, today, I am uh, the chief flight director uh, in the flight operations directorate, and it's it is pretty exciting uh, to sit here today. You know, after 20 years, and and look back, you know, see some of the same faces on this panel and, and really have an opportunity to, to celebrate everything that we've done. And and so today I'm the chief flight director, but if you go back 20 years, um, I was just starting out um, at, at NASA as a flight controller, just, you know, newly minted and was able to sit, uh, sit console for uh, the very, very beginning of Space Station. And so for a while, I, I would tell everyone I had the entire history of Space Station in my head. And now it's gotten so complicated, I don't think I can remember it all. But uh, but for a while I could I could uh, go flight by flight by flight and and uh, that was how I organized my whole life not birthdays not holidays space station uh, uh, flights were the milestones and and really still are actually uh, that's kind of how we mark time in our world so um, super exciting to be here and uh, hope you enjoy what we talk about today. Thank you. Next, let's go to Emily Nelson. Good morning and hey to everybody. So let's see, right now I'm the Deputy Chief Flight Director in the Flight Operations Directorate and um, we're still also active flight directors. 
Um, 20 years ago, I was also starting out as a junior flight controller. Um, the Expedition 1 launch marked a transition where um, one role that we had early on was going to retire because the, the, the space station, which had actually been in orbit for a while, was going to have people on it. And so we were going to retire one position and move into a full team. So um, I was excited to be transitioning into additional uh, responsibility and, and getting maybe to become a little bit more senior as a flight controller someday. But I was a, a pretty baby flight controller back in, at that point in time. That's pretty cool. Um, how about we go to David Korth next? Hey, good morning. Uh, it's good to be back among friends. Uh, I hung up my flight director spurs several years ago. Um, so now I'm the uh, deputy manager of the ISS avionics software uh, division, what Kenny was doing 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, I was uh, sitting console in what we call the blue thicker, a uh, much smaller version of what's behind Emily right now. Uh, and I was the lead planner for Expedition 1. And so, the, you know, I, I look back and I was reflecting uh, this last couple of days on what we've accomplished since then. And thinking, you know, how much preparation went into Expedition 1 and, as Emily mentioned, uh, the un uncrewed station that existed for a year and a half, two years before uh, the uh, Expedition 1 crew showed up and how much work effort we all put into working with the Russians trying to come up with what the plans were going to be, how we're going to integrate things together. And when we finally cut our first plan and uplink, that's when it, you know, it hit us, uh, this is real, this is actually happening. Um, so, uh, and, and clearly a lot has transpired, uh, both with all of our partners and uh, the vehicle itself and, and the evolution of operations. So I'm, I'm glad to be part of this group today. It must have been such an exciting time. Uh, finally, we're going to go to Pooja Jasrani. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, like Brandy mentioned, uh, my name is Pooja Jasrani and I am a flight director. Um, I was selected in 2018, so I'm one of the newer flight directors in our office. I was selected with five others, uh, making a class of six. And so I am, the, you know, one of the baby flight directors, you would say, uh, but have had a lot of experience now at NASA. In 2011, sorry, I should say in 2000, I was um, in 11th grade. Um, I was in 11th grade and had a lot of space posters in my room and it's you know, was very inspired by space and wanted to be um, where I am today. So, um, very excited to be here. Thank you. I saw a lot of head shaking with the 11th grade, but. <laughs> yes, this is already so much fun. Um, so now we're going to back up a little bit. Uh, although a lot of this group supports flight operations and mission control, that's not everything that flight operations does uh, by a long shot. So Norm, since you're the deputy director of flight uh, operations, why don't you give us an overview of what Flight Operations Directorate is. Okay, Brandy, in 11th grade, goodness, that, that's a shocker. Um, so Flight Operations, we live in a lot of acronyms, so you hear FOD, it's synonymous with Flight Operations, it's Flight Operations Directorate. And really what we are is a service organization uh, for all the major programs for uh, development and mission execution. And so what I'll talk a little bit about and give you an overview today is really for, for station, but, uh, but it does support uh, all programs. And, you know, the program is our customer. We're an org of about 2,500 people, and we have three major functions within uh, flight ops. You can think of us as kind of like a tripod. Uh, one leg of that is our astronauts. We have about 47 active astronauts today. Uh, the other leg is uh, aircraft operations. We call it AOD. And we have about 60% of the aviation assets for the agency within flight ops. We have 19 T-38s that are used for uh, space flight readiness training. We have a cargo transport, the big guppy you've probably seen flying around. We have some high research um, uh, aircraft used for science and training. And then we have a Gulfstream 3 and a Gulfstream 5, which are used to uh, to transport the crews home after landing and, uh, and get them back reunited with their family. And then we have the uh, the plan, train, fly part of the organization, which is really the biggest part of, uh, of FOD, although it all works together. But really that plan, train, fly is what we do for the program. We 
we really start planning and training each of these ISS increments, which are about six months long, about a year and a half out. And the teams very, work very hard to take the program requirements, uh, metabolize those into a plan, a very detailed plan of how to, how to accomplish this. We train the astronauts, we train the flight controllers, uh, we integrate the teams, and we get ready uh, to go in and, and execute that uh, in the real-time environment. And that plan really starts from when the astronauts leave their families to go to launch, uh, all through uh, all activities on orbit to the time that they, uh, they come back to Earth and are reunited uh, again with their families. Where you see a lot of this uh, really culminate is in the Michigan, Michigan Control Center. Uh, many of you have probably seen Mission Control, whether you've seen it uh, in person or in photos. Uh, that's the command and control center for the International uh, Space Station. These teams um, work 24-7, 365 uh, days a year. Uh, the flight director is really the conductor in these uh, real-time teams managing uh, all the systems uh, on board and, and the purpose of the teams in there is to manage the systems and also provide uh, crew safety uh, for this orbiting laboratory uh, in real time. The teams typically send about 30,000 remote control commands from the ground to the space station a month to manage this platform. So it's uh, it's very interactive, it's hands-on, it's tactile, and it's uh, and it's very uh, it's very rewarding. Um, you know, flight operations, we're very rich in tradition. Uh, we have our foundations of uh, what we call foundations of mission operations. They're leadership tenets, not unique to, to FOD, as we say, uh, but really for, uh, for any uh, effort that requires leadership. It's discipline, confidence, competence, toughness, teamwork, vigilance, and responsibility. And it's these leadership attributes that define our culture. And this culture, in addition to the flight rules, and procedures is really what provides the framework for the critical decisions and the operations that uh, are on. Dry, boring voices, you know, because that's what we do on console when things go wrong. And I'm not sure it quite it quite conveys, uh, you know, the the situation to to folks out there. Uh, but you know, I decided I'd try a little bit. So hopefully, people understand that, uh, you know, that's our equivalent of heart pounding, where we have these very calm faces and sort of monotone because <laughs> that's that's what we're trained to do yeah and just to add some color commentary to that one um i remember that day because i was with a team that was doing a training run upstairs and word spread that because it, it was pretty unusual for progress to not dock totally normally and so word had spread upstairs and this and we pretty much just like everybody took a pause and we moved our data from our simulation training data to the real-time data to just kind of follow along, you know, with bated breath from upstairs to see what are they going to do? How are they going to solve the problem? You know, we had a whole team that was following along that really, it was, it. yes, when you describe it technically and in the moment, you can't get all, you know, we don't make it a big exciting event. But I will tell you that from another room in the building having nothing whatsoever to do with the op, we were all watching because it was a, a kind of a really scary event. And I'll uh, let's see, Brandy. I'll I'll jump in, kind of from a, a program perspective. I don't I don't sit and do the do the actual console work, but um, you know I, I look at from a programmatic perspective. We've asked the flight ops team, uh, you know, take care of the crew, take care of the ISS, um, and if something goes wrong, you know, my perspective is get us through the shift, get us stable, and then we'll step back as an integrated group and take a look and see what our options are, try to figure out how to go, how to go forward. And um, at least one of the examples that I can think of, and maybe, maybe one of y'all can help me remember for some reason it was, I think it was 12A or 13A. We had a shuttle, shuttle dock to station. And um, uh, for whatever reason, the Russians had a computer failure and uh, we thought, Oh, no big deal. And then they had another computer failure and you're like, well, that's, uh, you know, unfortunate for those guys. And then you realize, well, that's really unfortunate for all of us because uh, because we need them in order to be able to um, stabilize the station so the shuttle can leave. And we had absolutely no clue as to what happened with the Russian computers. The Russians didn't really have a good understanding. Uh, there was um, um, there was a lot of uh, concern. I'll put it that way, because we were really in a situation where we couldn't keep shuttle forever. 
trying to figure out what to do. Um, we were uh, concerned about overall maintaining attitude control. Um, should we try to undock and not have these computers that could control the propulsive systems? Pucci, you probably remember this. But anyway, um, so uh, anyway, I just remember that was a, a – a, very concerning time for us at the program level because we were still building station. You know, we were still quite a ways from being done. And uh, to have a problem like this where you're really looking at each other going, how are we going to get out of this? I mean, this this could, uh, uh, you know, be a, a step in a very bad direction if, uh, if we try to let a shuttle go and not have a, a good way of ensuring that we can clear it from the station without any kind of a, a contact. So it was a um, – at least um, uh, over a period of days, it was it was something I think a lot of us lost sleep over, uh, working with the entire team, engineering, uh, our operations team, our safety communities, um, our partners, our Russian partners, trying to figure out because it wasn't just as simple as rebooting uh, that computer and bringing it back up. That the, it was a, a much more involved technical issue that, uh, uh, again, uh, kind of felt like it brought us to our knees there for a period of days. And I assume some of you might might have remembered that one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up for just a few minutes because I was actually on console. I worked that I worked that mission from the flight director console. It was actually my very first joint you know joint mission. So I'd been certified before that and had worked space station ships, but that was my first first joint mission on the on the ISS flight director team. So I came in. I was the the crew overnight shift. We put the crew to bed. And I came in, and and the lead of of, uh, of our team said, "Well, we're in free drift, and we can't figure out how to get out of it. Um, we needed the the computers on the space station to work, and then be able to hand back and forth in terms of the shuttle taking overall control of the of the combined space station shuttle. Um, but we were trying to get back to where the space station, you know, took took control of that. Like Kenny said, we couldn't couldn't have the shuttle do that forever, um, and so." I came in and we're free drift and, and we don't know how to get out of it. But here's here's the lesson I learned, right? So one of the more senior uh, flight directors was the lead and she looked at me and said, okay, so while we're figuring out how to get out of free drift, you know, what, what else can you do? We actually needed to move the mobile transporter, which is um, a piece of equipment where the robotic arm can ride up and down the length of the space station to set up for an operation the next day. So, you know, as a new flight director, you're just, you're kind of like, okay, here's our problem. You know, she was looking up and out like, hey, let's keep moving forward safely while we're still solving this really bad problem over here. You know, and it was in my early flight director career, one of the, the most important lessons that I've learned. What can you do to move forward, even when faced with a problem that right now you don't know how to solve? How do you move forward? you know, safely, of course. And so we moved the mobile transporter because we had to be free drift to do that anyway. We happened to already be free drift while we're over here trying to figure out how to solve the problem. The other piece of that is when you have a problem that big, everyone just shows up. Like, it's amazing. You don't have to make phone calls. People just know, like Emily was saying earlier, the team in the other room is looking at the data. Everybody's at home watching NASA TV. You know, people are getting things on their phones now more than they used to because phones are a little more more uh, uh, prevalent now. But but the data just gets out, and people just show up. What can I do to help? And and we formulate what's called a Team 4 where you have a another set of folks go really, really focus on that problem, leaving us in the control room again to continue flying the mission as much progress as we can make safely. So, you know, those are like two of my biggest flight director lessons that, that I carry with me from, from that specific uh, incident that, uh, that Kenny brought up. And I'll, just add, I'll just add one quick thing. So I actually started at NASA about two weeks after that shuttle flight. And it was the biggest buzz in town. I mean, the amount of conversations that happened after that shuttle flight and all the things that the team had done to recover. I mean, that was sort of my getting my feet wet uh, and really learning all about what FOD does. It, it was a great experience to start um, learning from. Yeah, that, that, that's, so, that's so cool. I feel like we could listen to your battle stories for a long time, but... Um, I know you've got uh, other things to get to today, but I did want to wrap up a little bit by talking kind of um, about how flight uh, flight director uh, flight operations directorate is is still evolving as we have new programs coming online. I know um, 
Holly, you supported the the first uh, SpaceX cargo mission, and Pooja, I think, is getting ready to support the first Boeing commercial crew mission as well. So um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about um, about how things are how we're adapting to those those new demands. Yeah, so you could probably do an entire panel on just that topic, right? Um, Kenny, Kenny was there as well. Norm was sitting behind me, so I was the uh, the flight director, the NASA flight director, sitting in the ISS, you know, flight control room responsible for the very first Dragon that came to the space station. So this is 2012. Um, to put that in perspective, we've now done over 20 of those. If you count uh, that demonstration, headed into uh, the 21st under under the the space station cargo contract. So I mean, two ish a year for the last, you know, almost almost 10 years now. So. Um, amazing to see how far we've come. You know, when you sit there the first time, we talked about this when we talked about Expedition One, right? You've put all this blood, sweat, and tears, planning, trying to figure out how to do this. Again, Kenny remembers all of this, and then and then you go live, and it doesn't it doesn't work exactly uh, like you'd planned. And that's where we really get to do our jobs. That's where that's what they pay us for, right? Is to figure those things out. And so um, we got about you know 120 meters from the space station, and our, our navigation sensors that communicated with the SpaceX Dragon um, didn't didn't look quite right, so we got to sit there for a little while and, and figure out how we were gonna gonna manage that in order to get uh, the the two vehicles to communicate and navigate and uh, navigate in safely. Um, and ultimately, we did figure it out. It's another one of those stories where like literally heart pounding, but you know when you tell it afterwards, it's like okay, well we sat there and calmly worked through it. You know we had our engineering support, we had. The program folks, you know, Kenny was in the other room, Norm sitting behind me, and and we figured out what to do and and do it safely, and we're able to bring the vehicle in. We did have to sit, you know, 120 meters from the space station for for a while, um, making sure our navigation sensors were working correctly between the two vehicles. And so, you know, from my standpoint, you look back, and now where we are with commercial. Um, is really amazing, you, you know, a tipping point in in human spaceflight for us to be able to incorporate a commercial partner and and bring them safely into the space station. Um, but to us, right, who started, you know, at the beginning of the space station, it it was just another opportunity, right? We we had uh, done Expedition One, we had figured out how to incorporate, you know, over time all of our international partners add their modules and their vehicles to the space station. And this was just one more in a in a continuum. And and so we look forward now with all of the, the pieces that we continue to do on space station and you know on into Artemis. And and for us that's you know con continuing to build on the skills and the and the culture. You know, at the end of the day, it's about relationships and teamwork and trust. And and you go and you figure out that that combination with with every partner with every provider with every team that, that we interact with and you know that's really the amazing thing to me about the international space station one of the most amazing things and so again i could talk forever but you know kitty and norm were there as well so i'll i'll hand to them well i'll provide just one aspect of it that that holly hit on and it's the teamwork and its relationships and and you know it was a fantastic day to get dragon birth but if you look at the journey to get there um, that that was really what made it special because you know the the commercial cargo came on the heels of the constellation program being canceled nasa deferring funds from um, government type work into to more of the private and commercial industries to where nasa buys a service instead of actually building a vehicle so that was the forefront of that and i'll tell you that the, the the dynamics between <laughs> commercial and, and NASA and government at that point was pretty toxic. It was, you know, NASA funding has gone down. It was given to commercial. It was just it, the timing was bad and the environment was was not great. And it really took, you know, Holly and her team and Kenny and the programs to, to really start helping um, build trust, as Holly said, because we were doing a lot of finger pointing back and forth. And it was getting us nowhere. Uh, and until, you know, those relationships started to be built, the trust started to be uh, instilled in that you need us. And NASA recognizes that we needed them as well. We're not the enemy. We're the solution. So are they. And we have to work together. So we started focusing. Instead of pointing at each other, we're pointing now at a common goal, that common goal of successful commercial cargo. 
And that is the foundation, and the success of that is the foundation we're resting on today with commercial crew. It's what we're going into with the uh, gateway and human landing system, and, and it all goes back to that. So leadership matters, relationships matter, and people and trust matter. So uh, just a great success story. I see, and, and Norm, absolutely, I agree with with you and Holly both. I mean, um, if we look back at when station started, did we know that we were going to end up in this model? Uh, not not necessarily. I mean, we sort of had to adapt the mission along the way, uh, based on on the guidance and direction that we've been given, and um, and the, again, that brought some new people into our. Our, our circle that we didn't didn't know about when we started this, but but um, uh, one thing I talk to people about um, up and out a lot is is the fact that that we have a space station culture. Uh, there's not you know every partner every whether it's commercial or whether it's international everybody brings their aspect of how to do things and how to look at problems and how to look at challenges and and how to accomplish things in their own way. But at the end of the day, you have to figure out how to to make that work with everybody else. And, and what ultimately comes out of that mixer, mixer, if you will, is a, is a space station culture. And, and we understand each other. Um, I, I like to tell people, you know, the technical problems don't really know international boundaries. They don't know contractual boundaries. They are problems. Uh, you know, you solve them the same way. The physics doesn't change just because you, you talk a different language. And so uh, you have to get together. You have to figure out how to work together to do that. And, and, I, and we did it early on with the partners, um, our international partners. And I think with our commercial friends, we're starting to see that same thing as, as both Holly and Norm talked about. Uh, you know, the, the early part, that storming, forming, norming thing, that there was a little bit of storming early on, and, and it took us a little bit. But uh, I think uh, in the end, you know, we had arrived at, a, at kind of a, a cultural understanding of how to get things done, and it's been extremely successful. And, and um, uh, you know, I think it's going to carry us forward, as Norm said, as we as we start to not just work with international partners but also commercial partners and, and trying to, uh, to go live around the moon and, and, and go do some work on the moon. Yeah, and Brandy, uh, yeah, I was just I was just going to mention that I think this is also just a very exciting time for younger generations. You know, the last time we flew off of U.S. soil was in 2011 for our last shuttle flight. And so to get to see uh, DM2 this summer fly, I mean, it was the buzz around town. It was the buzz around the world, you know, to get to see these astronauts go to the International Space Station and fly off of U.S. soil. And I think the SpaceX team is doing an outstanding job, and we have a, you know, a flight coming up in the next few weeks, as well as Boeing working really hard um, to do the same thing. So I think, you know, the next few years are going to be super exciting. Definitely. A lot of excitement these past 20 years and a lot more excitement to come. I think we are just about pretty pretty much out of time, so, but I did want to give um, Norm a chance to just kind of wrap up for us a little bit what we've talked about today. Well, Randy, great discussion, great panel. And, you know, I don't know how many folks have had the opportunity to uh, go out and see an ISS viewing where you go out and look in the night sky, early morning sky, and see a uh, station flyover. But if, if you've not had that opportunity, go do so because, you know, station didn't happen on its own. Uh, it was, you know, one vote in Congress. It took a lot of uh, teams to put this orbiting uh, outpost in orbit. <clears throat> and so when you look up at this... Um, this magnificent laboratory that's the size of a football field. It's nearly a million pounds of mass uh, in orbit, uh, orbiting the Earth about every 90 minutes. You realize it's real. There's human presence on board. There's been human presence for the last 20 years. And, you know, <clears throat> it really is an engineering marvel. And, and to me, miracles, uh, you know, miracles do happen when you have a vision uh, you provide the leadership, the perseverance, the political support, and, and teams that manage this thing day in and day out and have been doing that for the past 20 years. It's, it's incredible. And, you know, it's a great orbiting uh, laboratory for science and research, and it's also being used as a great um, uh, platform for developing hardware that's going to evolve us to the moon and Mars and beyond. So this is Amazing 20 years has gone by in a blink of an eye, uh, but the relationships and the teams that have made this all happen are what's uh, going to evolve us uh, to getting on the moon by 2024 and making that a reality as well. So I think I can speak for all of us that, 
you know, being part of this is just really special and uh, <clears throat> just really glad to be here today with our friends and see uh, just what this has become and how it's evolving even into the future. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much, Norm. That's a great idea. Definitely go out and wave at Kate, Sergey, and Sergey as they are flying over. And then uh, later this month, you'll get a chance to cheer on the Crew-1 crew as they launch to the space station on our SpaceX Dragon as well. Um, this is just the second in a series of six panels, so you're going to want to watch out for the rest of this series. Um, coming up is going to be all about science. That's the next one that we'll be holding, so you can watch out for that. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, Here's to 20 more years. Throughout my career at the European Space Agency, I passed many significant events in ESA's history. Milestones, first attempts, landmarks. <laughs>